The International Space Station, or ISS, is the most complex scientific and engineering project in history, and yet it has no tourists. People flock by the millions every year to see old presidents carved into a mountain, gigantic shopping malls, religious apparitions, casinos, theme parks, zoos, etc. But you can't load up your minivan with the kids and take a road trip to low Earth orbit. And I think that's a problem, because people need more than some pretty pictures and a celestial David Bowie cover to really appreciate something. And I think our accomplishments in space are worth appreciating, not to mention advocating for. So I've had this question in my head for a while now. How can the fact be made more immediate and tangible that what is perhaps humanity's greatest technical achievement of all time is constantly passing just 250 miles above our heads? Listen. This is the first prototype of the International Space Station Orbit Tracking Pointer. If that name isn't explanatory enough, its one job is simply to point directly at the ISS wherever it is in space, a small but constant reminder of what humanity is capable of. In this video I'll show you how I made it and talk about some of the science behind how it works. In celestial mechanics, or the study of how things move in space, simple orbits are called Keplerian, with the assumption of a two-body system. In other words, the mutual gravity is the only force in the system between two objects, in our case, the Earth and $150 billion space laboratory. With this assumption, orbiting bodies will continue indefinitely and predictably. For many situations, including games, two-body mechanics work just fine to model orbits. But just like the spherical cow and the frictionless plane, the Keplerian orbit is a simplification that isn't accurate enough for all real-world situations. Satellites orbiting the Earth are affected by variations in Earth's gravity due to its not-quite-spherical shape, drag from the tenuous outer atmosphere, gravity pulling from the Moon and the Sun, and even solar radiation. These are collectively known as orbital perturbations. Satellites meant to stay in orbit long-term have small engines to resist these forces and help them stay in their correct orbit, a process known as station keeping. Because of orbital perturbations and station keeping, the location of a satellite is not entirely predictable based on its orbital parameters. Take a look at this graph of the ISS's altitude over time. You can clearly see how its orbit slowly decays due to perturbations and its engines periodically boost it back up into a higher orbit. It's obvious how perturbations can pose a problem if you want to know where a satellite is at a certain point in time. Luckily, the locations of satellites are kind of important to us, so there are people keeping up with them all the time. The North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, whose main directive is to track and relay the position of Santa Claus every Christmas Eve, was one of the first governmental agencies in charge of tracking Earth's satellites. Now, the Joint Space Operations Center uses optical and radar observations to keep an eye on just about everything that orbits the Earth as a part of the U.S. Space Surveillance Network. Spacetrack.org collects this data and serves as a catalog and clearinghouse for the latest and greatest orbital information. Additionally, Dr. T.S. Kelso, who runs the Celestrack website, has been a champion of making this data available to the public and continues to organize and publish it on his website. Dr. Kelso has also written a series of excellent tutorials on satellite orbits, which I relied on heavily for this project, and I'll link them in the description below. By the way, all these organizations are on Twitter, tweeting away about satellites, which, it just warms my heart that that's a thing. That's a little bit of background about the science behind tracking satellites. Now let's take a look at the orbit tracking pointer itself. The tracker is powered by an ST Microelectronics Nucleo F401 development board. This board has an 84 MHz clock and 512 KB of memory, compared to the Arduino Uno's 16 MHz clock and only 32 KB of memory. Plus, it only costs $10. If you want some practice programming for an ARM chip, or you just need to be a little bit further from the specs of the Apollo Guidance computer than the Uno R3, it's hard to say no to these nucleo boards. Predicting the location of a satellite in the future is called orbital propagation, and the de facto standard model for doing this is called the Simplified General Perturbations Model, 
or just SGP. An open source version of this model was written in the C programming language by David Vallado as a companion to his textbook, Fundamentals of Astrodynamics and Applications. I ported this code to run on the Nucleo board without too much trouble. I have an Adafruit motor shield on top of the Nucleo. I had to port the library for this to work on the microcontroller as well, which turned out to be a bigger challenge for me. This shield drives both the stepper motor, which controls azimuth, and the servo, which controls elevation. The servo is connected to the slip ring to allow full rotation without getting any wires tangled. I had to make a few warranty voiding adjustments on the wood lathe to get it to fit. Most of the structural parts are actobotics, which is an aluminum mechanical construction system like an erector set on steroids. This stuff is not cheap, but I don't have access to a machine shop, so I considered this a shortcut worth taking. Everything bolts together, so it's great for prototyping, and if I get tired of it, I can just take it apart and build something new. The base is a scrap of paduk, which is a beautiful reddish-orange hardwood. It'll fade to a warm brown with exposure to UV. Now for the moment you probably skipped ahead for. For its first test, I wanted to catch the ISS while it was actually visible. If you've never seen the ISS pass overhead, I really encourage you to do it. I used the Heavens Above website to find a day when the ISS would pass overhead, in the late evening, bright enough to see. I literally finished coding the tracker about an hour before the transit, so I hurriedly brought everything outside to get set up. The clouds parted just in time and the tracker worked flawlessly, pointing directly at the ISS as it passed over. Such a great feeling to see it all come together and work perfectly the first time. And here's a quick demo in better light conditions. I initialize the azimuth to point to true north before powering it up. It goes through a quick routine just to show that everything's working correctly, and then begins pointing at the ISS. It's really that simple. The ISS orbits the Earth every 90 minutes, so the speed of motion is roughly equivalent to the minute hand on a clock. Slow enough that it's not really interesting to watch it, but fast enough that it's in a new place every time you glance over. I've got lots of ideas for extensions of this design. For now though, this prototype's just gonna sit on my desk at work, so my cat doesn't break it. And to remind me that the world is full of inspiration, if you just know what direction to look. Thanks for watching, and let me know what you think.